Okay, gang. Can everybody hear me out there all right? I'm trying to work on projecting my voice. Let me know how I'm doing. All right. All right. Thank you. Groupie in the crowd. Uh, my name is Michael Mikowski, and today I'm going to talk about how you can dump less and sash in favor of uh, CSS that is dynamically generated from JavaScript, and also explain some of the reasons why I've done so and uh, why it may benefit you beyond the fact that you can get rid of a, another DSL from your toolkit potentially. All right. So that means that I had to throw in the requisite dump truck for my illustration. So um, what I'm going to show you today in the words of a colleague, a friend, a mentor, uh, and a coworker of mine is impossible. All right. That's what he told our employer before they brought me on to do the work that I did. Um, and he wasn't actually lying because at the time it pretty much was impossible. Um, but uh, it's not any longer. And uh, I've worked on this for about a year on and off. And uh, it's about time to share it with the rest of the world. So you guys are the lucky ones. You picked the right room. Because, you know, instead of talking about how Angular adds a special ng attribute when you uh, use this CAN framework, we're going to talk about something that people aren't doing right now and that opens up a whole world of possibilities for you. Um, so let's talk about first what's wrong with less and SAS. I know that some people out there love this stuff. I know that uh, Josh, my co-author, was always a big fan of SAS. Well, let's see. First, we have Luis, who is a reviewer at Manning. Uh, he said that I used less once and it ate my dog, which means he no longer has the dog ate my homework excuse uh, for any schooling he might be doing. I don't know how truthful that is, but Luis seemed uh, pretty concerned about it at the moment. Uh, another wise individual, uh, my parents, said that just because everyone else is jumping into SAS doesn't mean you have to, too. Those should be strong enough for you. However, if they're not, think about this. Less and SAS are another abstraction layer. They're a domain-specific language. You have to get good at them to master them. And by the time you get good at them, oftentimes you forget the underlying technology. Or worse yet, you run into people who've never used anything but SAS and don't understand the basic principles underlying CSS. Now, if it were just these three issues that caused me concern, um, I would probably let it slide. But the real problem, and the reason why I got into this problem space in the first place, is our next point. They all create CSS at the wrong time. I even put yellow arrows in there to remind me how important that was. OK? So let's take a look first at uh, some CSS that's not generated at the wrong time. Okay, we'll talk about what the wrong time means in a little bit here. But first, let me bring you to my first demo of the day. And uh, this is actually my first proof of concept uh, about a year ago now uh, in employing dynamic style sheet creation using uh, JavaScript. What you're going to see here is I'm going to click on this link, and it's the exact same content. Um, this is not a complex test, by the way. But notice that I click on the link, I get completely different styles, positions, etc. cetera, um, each time I click the, on the link. Now, how many style sheets do you think I have in this page? Anybody want to gander a guess? Three. Three. Yeah, you had to pick the one that has to be obviously wrong, right? Um, OK, so um, since I'm not trying to make a fool of anybody in the audience, uh, just a fool of myself, 
Um, there is actually two style sheets in this DOM. And no matter how many of these I throw on here, no matter how many styles I use, there's always just two style sheets. The style sheet that's currently in use and the style sheet that's being written. All right, but this was the proof of concept and it gave me enough um, confidence to move ahead with a full-blown implementation that's now used by hundreds of millions of people every day. And just in case you forgot those images, here they are again. All right. So now that we've uh, hopefully caught your attention, um, let's talk about me a little bit and get that out of the way, all right? So you've probably seen this book around here. You've probably seen my co-author around here. Uh, he gave a presentation in this room a little earlier with a larger audience, so I'm a little bit jealous there. I'm lying, I'm a lot jealous. Um, but uh, um, so this is a book that Josh and I started in 2011 and uh, we expected to spend six months on it and come out with a 200 page book and we came out with a 400 page book two years later. So it was a real experience and a real growing experience actually. So um, I'm currently the senior director at Qualaroo. You're going to see a lot of Qualaroo today because uh, that's a lot of what I've been doing recently. This is not a sales pitch for Qualaroo. You don't have to buy anything. All right, uh, you don't have to take an online survey. Um, the ideas and the uh, concepts I'm sharing with you today are free of any licensing involved in Qualaroo. So I wanna make that real obvious, okay? Uh, we're sharing it now with the world um, and I, I hope you appreciate it and enjoy it. Um, I have been a developer on many, many uh, SPAs. Uh, this slide says six, it's probably more like seven now. Uh, and uh, architect, uh, on uh, primary architect on all but one and a co-architect on, on that other one. Um, previous to getting into the JavaScript uh, side of the world, I was working with Mod Perl and uh, application servers, uh, and I loved it. And in fact, the reason why I got into JavaScript was because I wanted to take Node.js and do the same stuff with Node.js that I did with uh, with Perl um, and you know the ability to basically write my own application server. Um, but the job market was such that uh, everybody wanted a UX developer and I happened to have an industrial design degree so that kind of meshed. So I haven't done nearly as much work in Node.js as I wanted to. So, um, and my first SBA was in 2007, okay? Now, if you read my book and you knew what parts I wrote and what parts Josh wrote, you know, the majority thereof, you might think that I favor boring convention. However, I'm here to tell you, you might think different by the time we finish this presentation. So what is JS CSS? First of all, it's not a term yet, right? SPAs were a term when Josh and I started using that term, or not a wildly used one, actually. Uh, there was about five different names for SPAs. There also wasn't a term called the shell for an SPA either. We made that shit up. Uh, <laughs> seriously, because we didn't, there were no other names for it, right? So what's JS CSS? Well, it's a term that might catch on, but for today's purposes, I'm referring to JavaScript generated CSS, okay? And all that means is that CSS that's created and applied on demand by your JavaScript application, or your logic, all right? That's all I'm gonna talk about here. It's, it's not static, it's not compiled, it's not hand-coded, it's not done at, at build time, it's done at runtime. okay? It's not loaded from external files. It's your own logic creates it. You may use external files as assets to help determine what it should be, but ultimately your logic writes the CSS, okay? So now that I've beat that drum enough, we throw in the swirly text. Um, okay. So, something to think about. Now, um, what we've done is actually created a thing called a CSS style manager. No, I can't give you CSS style manager, but I can tell you how it works. And at some point I hope to have an open Pretty cool. Um, so 
It's been developed and refined at Qualaroo for a year by, by yours truly. Um, and uh, like I said, we're sharing with the world for the first time today. And in many cases, it's a good option versus less in fact, SAS. In fact, you'll see that the stuff that we do with uh, dynamic CSS cannot be done with less in SAS. And I'll explain why shortly. Okay? See, these, all, all this I'll explain why shortly is to keep you awake. All right? So, um, so we're going to use uh, JavaScript, uh, some browser features, HTML, DOM, CSS. If any of these are scary to you, you shouldn't have bought a ticket. Um, so here's another uh, example of us actually dumping the lesson sets. So here's an example of what we do at Qualaroo. We do online surveys. Okay? When I joined the company, this is our product. Okay? Um, it's not the glitziest thing in the world, but uh, a there's a big need for this sort of thing. There's a number of companies that compete in the space. So um, we are third-party JavaScript, which means we have to be really lightweight, right? Now, uh, I don't know about you, but probably <laughs> a few of you have run into a site that uses Discuss or LiveFire on occasion. Now, I don't want to pick on these guys, but I will. Um, <laughs> now, seriously, they, they have a harder problem. They're dealing with dynamic content with, with uh, um, with comments, and they're also using iframes, among other things, to provide third-party content. And um, man, those things, I've got a, a really, really fast tablet, and um, Discuss still will drag things to its knees sometimes, because it's just, it's pulling in so many external resources. It's a big, big third-party app. We didn't want our app to be that big, we couldn't justify it the way Discuss or LiveFire could. Um, we instead uh, tread very, very lightly. We load only one file, all of our images, all of our logic, all of our data, all of our CSS, all of our HTML comes in one file, one HTTP request, that's it. All right? And that one file is smaller than a medium-sized JPEG. We have no jQuery because we couldn't make it smaller than a medium-sized JPEG if we threw jQuery in there, no matter how compressed we made it. So that means that I got to write all of my own jQuery routines that I needed. There's, uh, like I mentioned, no external images, no external CSS or HTML. Oh, and on top of that, now we do mobile. So this is the entree into the, actually this change of technology that we undertook. And actually, it's a really good strategy when you're adopting a new technology. If you've got something that's not critical to the business, deploy your proposed uh, business critical new technology on that first so you can perfect it before you roll it over to the rest of the organization. That's exactly what we did here. We perfected the technology on mobile, which is a new market for us. So if we screwed up, you know, we screwed a few customers. But uh, and then we got it right. And then we actually ended up migrating that over to everybody, including all desktop clients. So here's an example. I just want to give you a feel for it. Uh, by the way, you can play along at home if you want. You go to michaelmikowski.com. It's my vanity page. So um, uh, we don't have air sickness bags here, so don't read too far. Um, but you can actually see the survey on your phone or your computer or your tablet. And by the way, if you look at your neighbor's device, you'll notice that it looks different. Also, a thing that's interesting to do is zoom in. Look how we zoomed in. The, the, the uh, base uh, font size here is probably 12 pixels, right? But that's zoomed in probably four times. So that means that the font point size down below is probably around two points in order to get that consistent size in there. So no matter how zoomed in you are or zoomed out or where you're panned on the page, when our survey comes up on mobile, it always looks like that. And if you zoom out or zoom in while you're seeing that, it will adjust to look exactly like that. And it does that by dynamically adjusting the CSS that's totally dependent upon your device and your device orientation. Uh, and we could even have it hooked up to things like your heartbeat or the ambient temperature or the ambient light meter, 
Why? Because we generate CSS at runtime, where it should be generated. So here's a survey. First step here in mobile, it's, we see it, it's an optional screener. If you're in mobile, we sense that you have a mobile device, we'll show a screener. If you're on a desktop device, you won't see one. You then, of course, recognize that, hey, I think that Mikowska guy wrote this thing, so I'm going to check this out. You know, play along with me here. All right, so you can click on, yes, I'll give feedback, and then you will see, um, uh, this is kind of a silly little survey that I've had running on my site for a while. Before I took the job at Qualaroo, I tested out their product. Um, it's the same client that runs on uh, any um, browser uh, of any size, and it adjusts accordingly. This is uh, shown on my Nexus 4. Here I've clicked on, I find it useful. Um, you guys want to click on the 10, so that's kind of, you got to scroll down if you uh, have a small device like this. Otherwise, you'll see it. Uh, oh, by the way, if you have a larger device, you'll notice that the color scheme even changes um, because we found that lighter schemes work better on mobile devices and darker schemes tend to work better on uh, uh, the, uh, the larger desktop uh, sizes. Um, again, and then finally, there's a thank you, okay? All right, so that's a typical survey. So, as I mentioned, it's not very simple because we have to support numerous device sizes and capabilities and all these things that occur at runtime. Now, the classic way to handle that is what we're going to do is we're going to pre-compile uh, style sheets for all possible combinations that we can think of that we want to support. Like, oh, I want to support iPhone, and iPhone is awfully narrow, so I'm going to have a special style sheet so I use a narrow font and an iPhone. Okay, oh, I'm gonna run into a retina display, so I'm gonna have a special style sheet I pull for a retina display, et cetera, et cetera, yada, 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 ad nauseum, okay? That's the classic way to do it, but the problem is, if anybody's ever worked on a project like this, is that if you're trying to be responsive, your CSS quickly explodes into an unmanageable mess, and where SAS and LESS used to be a tool to help streamline your development of CSS, it ends up becoming a chore and a big monolith that has to be managed at runtime and somehow tied into your logic in some obtuse way um, that, uh, that tends to be fragile and uh, difficult to manage. But there's a better way. So, um, you know, we also have a host kite, uh, hoist host site color scheme. Somebody has a light colored site, they want a light colored survey, dark colored site, et cetera, okay? So um, at this point, I'm going to uh, take a quick detour uh, into demo land again. Uh, and in demo land, I'm just gonna show you uh, a little bit of the, uh, what we did for testing. Um, so uh, I'm gonna show you what we call units. Um, this is an overlay unit. This is the exact same code because this email collector, uh, as they call it, is actually just an online survey, okay? We've all seen these before, right? One thing that's different about this is that unlike a lot of the ones that like block your use of a mobile site, it actually works. If you rotate your phone or uh, it, it, it always takes up the same amount of space, uh, it's closable always, it doesn't interfere with the base page, which is actually a big leap over uh, a lot of uh, ex uh, competing products. Same code here is going to run a uh, top left survey. I'm gonna exit that, okay? Now I'm going to use dark and I'm gonna use a bottom right survey. Okay, I have to move my cursor here to trigger it. Do all different sort of trigger methods. Okay, this is all the same code. Okay, um, I have another survey here. Take a look at markdown. Now, this is my internal testing tool, so, you know, there's some rough edges here. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, big Jesse Handler. Um, uh, I can, uh, let's say, remove my branding on this thing now. So you see down at the bottom here, we have a little markdown uh, test and this little follow-through thing. Uh, I'll exit that. Now I'll, I'll click on uh, the bottom right pop-up again here. <laughs> 
and you'll see that the branding is now gone. This is all dynamically adjusted, right? So the key thing is, is that we now have dynamic logic control over all aspects of the presentation of our uh, application, which is for the first time where we have all that. You know, we have HTML, CSS, images, content, all under the control of logic. All right. Was that that boring? All right. Look at the different samples of clients that we have to support. And I'm going to do a lot of clicking here really fast. OK? That's our desktop. By the way, I've normalized all of these for uh, relative pixel sizes. So you're seeing them to scale here, all right? So there's a 10 point, by the way, the, the desktop is about 100 points per inch. The 10.1 uh, is a 300 PPI tablet. Then we have the seven inch tablet. Then we have the 4.7 inch phone. I know you're thinking it's the Apple 6, but it's actually the Nexus 4. Um, and oh, by the way, I can turn that uh, tablet into landscape mode. Also my smaller tablet and my phone all into landscape mode. So right there we have seven different displays that all require uh, different CSS for optimized presentation. So I'm just gonna quickly walk you through uh, the presentation here um, just to give you a feel for it. Notice there was the first, there was the phone, it had a screener on it, then here's another uh, tablet. It's a smaller tablet and that has a screener on it. But notice that the large screen in portrait does not have a screener on it because it's considered too big to have a screener. Uh, same thing for the desktop, and here we go again with the two um, tablet and phone, and then here's the large tablet. Again, the large tablet's treated more like a desktop than uh, as a mobile device. So there's our screeners. Let's take a look at our multiple choice questions. Here we go. Okay. Notice how different these things look. Look at the different zoom levels involved with these. Okay. Wow. Again. Here's where we're zoomed in further. You couldn't tell that we're zoomed in further on these, uh, the, the small phone and tablet device because we make sure that the scale is always the same presentation to the end user, right? But now that I'm zoomed in on uh, this uh, larger tablet or on the, um, um, uh, or on the desktop, you'll see that the, the uh, survey actually gets larger with the rest of the page, which is our desired behavior. Also notice here, this is a rating question. 0 to 10. Notice how that in mobile it's a vertical orientation versus a uh, horizontal one. Notice again the desktop style clients are a dark theme, whereas the mobile clients by default are a light theme. And again, you get a feel for all of this. Okay, so I told you I was going to be clicking a lot here, and I didn't want to linger in any one of these, but the point is, is that, um, you know, we had. What we just saw there was approximately 49 different style sheets. And that is in the course of about 49 clicks. Uh, as you can imagine, we have a lot more style sheets we write every day. So um, the classic CSS hierarchy, I've already touched on this a bit, is that you'll, you'll generally have like site rules, like I'm going to oranges.com. So I'm gonna have themes and colors, et cetera, that are based on oranges, uh, the overall site. But then I'll have like a rule to some subsection of it. Like here we're gonna have sans serif font, right? And then I'm gonna have uh, a section rules and then uh, rules that apply to a page. And then I may have some device class rules uh, and then some outliers like I've talked about, okay? Again, uh, this is all static data. Uh, and it's problematic. You know, if you've been doing JavaScript development for a long time, they say don't test the user agent of the browser. Test the capabilities, right? Well, that what we're doing right now with CSS, with Less and SAS, is akin to testing the user agent of the browser, right? We don't know what the actual capabilities of the end client is. What we're doing is we're just, you know, we're just kind of, hoping that we get it right. You know, we're saying, okay, let's look at the user agent, and then if you are a Retina iPad, I'm gonna send you this CSS, and if you're not, I'm gonna send you some other CSS, right? And we're stuck with those limited tools. So, what, but what about the orientation? 
How would you like to stay at change style sheet if somebody puts more than five fingers on the screen at one time? Or more than two fingers on the screen at one time? You could easily do that if you have uh, control of CSS in, within your logic. Zoom level and pan, which we're obviously doing all right, right now, ambient temperature, ambient light, heartbeat, acceleration. We could have, uh, we could change the theme if somebody takes off too fast in their car or if they're falling from the sky, we could give them a good by wish. You know, uh, so about time of day or geolocation, all those things, anything your device can sense, we can use to drive styles. But hold it, we can only have eight style sheets in our library, right? Or you can have one style sheet and have it infinitely adjustable. So let's again look at the real problem here, and I think this illustrates it really well. I worked really, really hard on this, so please don't, uh, don't make fun of it, all right? Um, so if you look at a typical web application structure, uh, I always like to think of Ruby on Rails because uh, it's a very web 2.0 structure. It's not a bad structure, it's a big improvement over what was there before, but it's gotten a little bit aged. Um, so you typically have an environment. Environment means like, you know, hey, what's my OS? What's my database? That kind of thing. And inside the environment, we'll have a configuration for a web application, all right? And uh, there we'll define things like what color I want for my base fonts, et cetera. And then we'll have a build system that's, that is inside of that. So it'll take that configuration data and make something of it. What will it make? Well, it'll make assets, okay? Don't tell my mom I said that. But um, these um, assets typically were like HTML5, images, and CSS3, okay? Then finally, we'll, draw, we'll deliver our logic inside of those assets. And then, only then, do we actually deploy client and server. So what we had there, in case you missed it, I have a second slide where I emphasize the problem, okay? Where's the client? Where's the server? Where's the logic? It's nowhere to be seen. We're making these decisions without any runtime data, as illustrated by the yellow arrows that I had to pull out for a second time, all right? Only after those assets are created do we have this. And we've all had this back when, we, when JavaScript was a decorator's language, right? Like you could only do so much because the HTML was already there, right? The CSS was already there, the images were already there, you couldn't change them. You just had to kind of like work within that framework. So here's how we fix the problem. Yeah, you guessed it. Put the logic before the assets. Now we've got live data feeding into the logic, the application itself, on the client. Then and only then can we use all of these data sources to make a decision about what those assets should contain. Our images, we dynamically adjusted using Canvas. Our HTML5 using templating systems, which has become pretty much commonplace, but when Josh and I were first writing about it, it was you know, almost sacrilegious to do that. Uh, and then now, the, le the missing piece of the puzzle, the thing that I'm so excited about, my mother doesn't understand for a, a whip why I'm excited about this, but is that now we can, the, the CSS we can also control completely within that, that logic area, okay? I've talked about this before, but again, we do over 100 million style sheets, custom style sheets every day for customers around the world. All right, so we're gonna look back at our uh, example there, and now we're done with that. Let's talk about how that works, all right? I'm gonna back up, okay? So you're seeing that, remember when we were doing that demo, how fast things moved, okay? Ah, there we go, that'll work. F11, okay? Now, of course, this is not the most 
extreme thing in the world. But notice that all the attributes of this uh, style sheet pretty much change each time I click on this. Yeah, in a flash, everything is redrawn. Now, who out there who has seen an application where you see live CSS changes and you watch the web browser slow to a crawl as they're applied? Well, I have, because I've tried it. The problem is, is that when you change a style, you force the browser to reconsider the entire DOM. It has to scan every element to see if that style affects it. And then you do the next change, and it scans it again. You do 50 changes, and you got 1,000 elements, you do 50,000 element scans. I was determined to be a little smarter than that. Okay? So, if we had a thousand element scans on here, does anybody want to take a guess at how many element scans we have in this change? That's what I thought. That's all right, people. I'll do the speaking. Um, there'd be a thousand element scans. If I did a hundred changes, there'd be a thousand element scans. If I did a thousand changes, there would be a thousand element scans. In other words, we only have the browser scan the elements once for any set of changes, no matter how many changes we make. And that is vastly more performant. There we go. Oh, we'll go with that one. All right. So now, here's the big reveal. How are we doing on time? Do I have to stop now? Um, the big reveal is this. This is how we do it. Y'all. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. OK, so this big box is a browser. Inside the browser, typically, we have a JavaScript engine. Okay, like V8. And we also have a DOM. There are a few more parts to a browser than that, but those are the key large components that we're interested in here. Now, the next thing that happens is we have a script tag that loads our single file into the JavaScript engine component. That loads our application logic, and it loads all that inline stuff we talked about before. Content, uh, data, styling, images, right? Uh, now, the first thing that happens when we initialize our logic is our app creates two style sheets. Remember how I talked about, hey, we only use two style sheets? No matter how many different variations we show, here's the reason why. So we create style sheet one and style sheet two. And um, when the DOM is ready, we then um, switch on our first style sheet and make that uh, active. And that is then applied to any elements that we write. Okay. Now, if we need to change anything with the styles, and typically we need to change a lot of things with our styles, we don't write those changes into style sheet one. We wipe out whatever was in style sheet two, and we write our new style sheet into style sheet two. But style sheet two is not enabled yet. Only when we're finished writing with style sheet two, do we switch to that style sheet? Thus forcing one element scan, uh, or one scan of the DOM elements, and applying all the changes at the same time. This is called double, double buffering. Uh, it's been in use in various factors for, oh, hundreds or thousands of years. Um, I haven't patented it for this purpose. Um, don't, write, don't work for the right company, I guess. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not bemoaning that fact. I think it's just a, a great way to uh, 
improve the performance of your application and uh, while managing dynamic style sheets. So here we show an example of where we're going to change again. Notice that style sheet two is currently active. We wipe out the contents of style sheet one, re uh, recalculate our style sheet, and then we just switch back to that. And now we have our new styles there. Okay. I do want to point out one thing that's really interesting about that. Um, and you know what, I'll get to it. So um, I don't want to jump ahead of myself here. So remember our 100 million end users at Qualaroo. As I mentioned, uh, we write a custom style sheet for every customer. In fact, we'll write a custom style sheet. If anybody here looked at my vanity page and got a survey and zoomed in or out, we may have written a style sheet for you for 10, 10 different times. Especially, if you don't realize it, but if you reorientate your, uh, your device, a number of styles have to change to give you the optimal experience on that. And so every time you like do this, you're writing a new style sheet. So if you want to write 50, 50 style sheets, go like this. Um, so we use the uh, style manager, and of course that allows us to go into mobile as we wanted to do. And like I said, we first employed on mobile, got everything that was going to be broken, broken on that, fixed it all up, and now our client that goes to every single customer, end user, or almost every single end user, uh, is, uh, is the same client that we use on mobile. So a nice way to uh, implement that. This actually here is a kind of a, a digression. Uh, this is the, um, the, the code that I walked into. People talk about testable code. Um, this wasn't horrible code, but it had 250 public methods or thereabouts for everything was built as one giant object and there was no distinction between a public object and or a public method and a private method, which makes for lots of fun. Um, and this is where it kind of dovetails to what Josh was talking about today. I refactored that into a model that has uh, an event queue and so uh, what happens is the model handles all the data and then it just fires off events that tell the outside world, hey, I want you to render some HTML or hey, I want to send out an HTTP request or something like that. Um, the, the bottom line on this is that um, number one, we went from about 250 public methods to three. Um, so that's all our end customers really needed. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously we get a much more robust and testable code base by doing so. So I won't talk too much more about this. Uh, so let's talk about the results. Um, so first of all, we can do single style changes in situ, which uh, is just a fancy way of saying in place, but, you know, I got that French gene in me. Um, Larger changes are much, much faster with the double buffering technique. Uh, and I, I've already done the math on the reasons why, uh, but there it is in black and white for you out there. Um, now this is the point that I was gonna make and get ahead of myself, but I think this is a really cool point. We cascade in software. Again, that doesn't sound too exciting when it first dribbles off my lips, but we cascade in the software means that if you look at a web inspector on an element that's affected by a style in Chrome, you will often see that some, something like uh, color, font color, is overwritten like eight different times for one style because you know, your site style had a default color, then the section had a default color, then the page and then a subsection, right? Uh, and that's a lot of work for the browser. The way we do it though, we have a cascade as well, but our output is only one style sheet. So how do we do that? Well, we actually have maps in our code that represent these sheets and we merge them together. And so, we reduce the style sheet load uh, by around a factor of five. And you don't see a style with 
cross marks through it anymore. What you see is a style with an attribute like color and it's exactly what it's supposed to be. Okay, so again, the cascade is in our software. We calculate it out. Um, of course, everyone's gonna say it's cleaner, faster, easier to debug, and uh, makes you more popular with the ladies. But um, really, it is cleaner, faster, and easier to debug. <laughs> About the ladies part, I guess you're on your own. Uh, no offense to the ladies in the room. Um, uh, it is nice to be able to worry about CSS at the same time that you're worrying about HTML and other presentation technologies. People often talk about context switches, right? And the reason why going from Node.js to Java on the back end is problematic. Well, it's the same kind of thing here. Like we're doing all this dynamic content like HTML and image manipulation and content manipulation in our logic but then we have to fall back to style sheets that are created at um, that are created at build time, and so it's really a a pain in the style sheet uh, to to have to do that. Where's my cursor? There we go. Uh, also, you get better uh, user experience. There's less stuttering. There's less load in the browser. So as I mentioned before, um, as a third-party application, it also gives us the capability to do a single file load for our entire application instead of loading up uh, potentially uh, many CSS style sheets. Our uh, CSS bloat uh, pretty much goes away. I mean, we've probably all seen less than SAS applied to create many, many kilobytes or even megabytes of data, and here it it's just gone, uh, or, or greatly reduced anyway. Um, as I mentioned, the cascading software, and as I mentioned, the same model controls content and styling. And ultimately, this allows you to do what previously was impossible, which is create dynamic styling that is personalized for every individual that visits your site. Now. Not everything is roses. There are certain advantages to less than SAS. And after a few hours, I came up with some of them. Not kidding. Obviously, there's less safety and built-in wisdom to what I'm talking about. If you grew up with SAS and have never worked with less, I'm sorry, never worked with uh, CSS directly, doing this is gonna be some, a, a hard slog, okay? Um, so, both of those have been around for a very long time, or five years, you know, give or take, which is a long time in our industry. Um, and we do have, in the style manager, we have uh, some guardrails, but not at the same level of the less than SAS. Um, there's also a challenge of browsers. Now, what I'm showing you is robust enough that we're able to roll it out to hundreds of millions of end users um, on a daily basis. But some older browsers just can't cope. Um, if you're dealing with IE8, you can probably make it work, but you probably don't want to spend the time. And that's the position we came to, actually. Um, and uh, the other guidelines there are, are minimum requirements, but lucky for us, um, that represents somewhere around 98.5% of our end users. The others we just don't show to. And uh, the, 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 the people that um, are in the 1.5% zone are the demographic that we don't even want to give surveys to. So we can live with that. If you can live with that, then you have this opportunity to use this uh, technique with your web applications as well. And I think at that point, we get to the obligatory dump truck less SAS screen, which means presentation is over. So um, I don't know if we have any time for questions, guys. Let's see. That's it, guys.